This conference will now be recorded. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Geo Aqua Watch uh, webinar um, for October. My name is Dr. Mary Beth Neely. I am the scientific coordinator for Geo Aqua Watch. Um, our new director, Dr. Gada El Sarafi from Deltares, could not be with us today, so she asked me to introduce our speaker. Um, we do want to let you know that the uh, Geo Aqua Watch webinar series has been going on since 2013, and we do have quite uh, uh, an impressive history of uh, past webinars. We try to hold the series um, featuring about six webinars um, a year, uh, and <clears throat> um, we're delighted today to have uh, the second um, Prime Water um, co-hosted uh, seminar series today. Um, our presenter is uh, Dr. Kyriakos Kandris, um, and he is um, with MVIS uh, Consulting. He's a research associate uh, working on predictive tools for earth observations and hydroecological modeling. Um, he has quite an impressive educational um, experience. He uh, has earned an engineering degree, uh, master's uh, in water resources, science and technology, and a PhD degree <clears throat> in bioremediation. Um, all of those were earned at National Technical University in Athens, Greece. Uh, and uh, just a reminder to uh, please mute your microphones uh, until the end of the presentation when um, Dr. Candress will take questions um, from the audience. You may also use the chat to moderate your questions uh, and, and, uh, or to, to place your questions and I will moderate the question uh, um, at the end of, at the conclusion of the talk. I will also post the link to um, where the recording for today's talk can be found later this afternoon. Um, go ahead and um, take it away, Dr. Candress. Thank you. Well, thank you for the warm introduction and, uh, of course, for being given today the opportunity to present um, part of the work that uh, is being performed uh, in Prime Water Project. Uh, the first part was a few weeks ago, presented by uh, Dr. Giardino. And uh, today's um, presentation is uh, actually an effort of us to, to test the utility of um, multispectral satellite data uh, for the development of uh, data-oriented solutions for the simulation of phytoplankton dynamics in, uh, in inland waters. So um, before I, um, I start, uh, I'd like to take an extra minute to, um, uh, to present briefly uh, the focus areas of, uh, of Prime Water. And of course, I would like, first and foremost, to acknowledge all the participating, participating entities. Um, so um, Prime Water uh, is um, an EU-funded project, an international collaborative effort, international meaning that um, it does not comprise only EU-funded, EU-based uh, entities, but also partners from the United States and Australia. So it's a unique opportunity for us to work together as a group, as a consortium, in two main uh, focus areas. The one is it has been presented, uh, as I said, in the first of the two um, events hosted by the Aqua Watch, uh, and uh, let's say uh, focuses on the retrieval of uh, what are called in phytoplankton related data from uh, from satellites the other focus area is which relates to today's discussion um, focuses on the uh, junction let's say of the of earth observation data with uh, modeling tools hydrological and ecological modeling tools for inland waters so that's the two main uh, key let's say um, uh, research areas of, of prime water which of course moves one step forward because what uh, we are also trying to address is how we progress from this um, research-oriented let's say approach 
to um, addressing operational needs for water managers and uh, the water industry in general um, through operational services. Uh, having that said, I can move, let's say, to what has motivated part of today's presentation and uh, largely uh, this uh, junction, as I said, of Earth observation data with uh, hydroecological modeling. So, on one hand, I think we can all agree on that that over the last years there's uh, continuously increasing availability on da of data on water quality and, of course, on phytoplankton-related uh, parameters. Either that comes from discrete or continuous sampling, uh, grab samples or sensors, or as as the case of our project, remote sensing or model data, or even uh, other sources, uh, the so-called citizen science, crowdsourced data. In any case, we're talking about a, uh, a wealth of data that is being uh, related to, um, to phytoplankton, let's say, uh, dynamics and um, yeah, of inland waters. Uh, so we have data on one hand, but what uh, this is actually what motivated us is that we are lacking a clear and concise way of transforming those data into what I refer to here as uh, actionable intelligence. So th there is a uh, uh, room here for um, uh, for research and uh, creating this, um, let's say, methodology that can lead us to uh, extracting insights from data. So that's one clear um, motive that we had. The other is that we also um, find that um, to a large extent um, this uh, wealth of data uh, is um, still not uh, totally exploited in terms of forecasting and as I mentioned previously um, operational purposes. So uh, having those two um, critical let's say um, motives in mind even from uh, from the early stages of the project or the drafting of the proposal actually, we tried to um, uh, make uh, clear uh, scientific questions that we try of course to answer through our work, uh, starting with the first one, which is whether we can exploit uh, satellite data, and I specifically refer to multispectral satellite data, to develop um, explainable data-driven models for phytoplankton dynamics. Uh, and uh, by explainable, I think this is a good opportunity to, um, to clarify a little bit what I, uh, what I mean. Uh, one, um, let's, let's say, a problem and um, the root of skepticism against data-oriented solutions is always the fact that it is uh, largely uh, considered as black box. And it seems to be in uh, not that transparent, let's say. So a clear goal of our work here is not only to develop a, a, a credible model, but also one that can be uh, understood why it predicts and why it succeeds and why it fails every time. So thereby we can not only communicate it by uh, machine to another computer, but also to uh, the end users who are, of course, uh, well aware of the mechanism, so we really need to prove that we are building models that make sense. So this is the first question. Can we use multispectral satellite data to provide such models? The second question, and this is related with the overall aim of operationalization and forecasting services, is whether we can utilize those models to and push them to um, operational uh, services and use them in real, in real time to forecast those uh, phenomena of phytoplankton, let's say, uh, dynamics of, of uh, lakes and reservoirs in particular. And the third uh, scientific question asked within prime water, uh, amongst others, is whether we can utilize those data-oriented solutions to improve the typical and more uh, um, uh, used, widely used mechanistic models. So these are the three main um, questions that are related to, um, to the component of prime water that uh, focuses on data, modeling, and uh, earth observation data. But in today's um, uh, webinar, we are going to be focusing mostly 
on question number one and number two. Um, happily, of course, I'm more than happy to discuss everything that relates to uh, the third question, but uh, due to respect of today's time, I think we should uh, mostly focus on question on the first two questions. So, uh, we, I already mentioned the need for transparency and for um, uh, interpretability of uh, this data-oriented solution. So, initially, what we wanted to do is to embody to our modeling approaches all those um, principles, all those mechanisms that we know that are relevant for um, what we want to simulate. So. Um, in our case, what we wanted to do first is to set up and formulate a set of predictors. That's on the left-hand side, what we believe that matters in our case. And on the other hand, we really need to find a good proxy for phytoplankton dynamics. And this is on the right-hand side of target, let's say, which is uh, chlorophyll A. So on one hand, we have uh, weather conditions and the contribution of upstream, uh, upstream, uh, upstream catchments, I'm sorry, uh, in our lakes and reservoirs. And on the other hand, we have um, chlorophyll A values. And in between, we need to devise um, an algorithm, a model, name it uh, whatever you want, that will map those predictors to um, chlorophyll A values. So this is what we refer to as the theory guided, guided uh, architecture. So in order to be even more um, clear on how we uh, thought that we could, would, would, we could work in this direction. Um, in our understanding, uh, in our approach, let's say, um, our targets, which are, as I said, uh, chlorophyll A values, are going to be in a function, let's say, of um, hydrological and meteorological factors of the last few days in our area of interest. And by hydrological factors, I refer to either total inflows in our lakes and the uh, total um, nutrient loads of this specific period of time. And by uh, meteorological or weather conditions, uh, I refer to either radiation, um, wind speed, uh, total precipitation and air temperature. And um, again, chlorophyll A will function as a proxy for, uh, for our uh, simulations for as a proxy for uh, phytoplankton dynamics and this is going to be retrieved as we said initially from multispectral satellite data so this is this um, strategy that we came up with and that is let's say in line with what we know that matters uh, in terms of phytoplankton dynamics and through this way we can easily let's say shift in time forward and backward and move from hind casting to forecasting by simply, as I said, uh, moving in this um, uh, blue axis here of, of time. So, since we already have discussed a little bit about our predictors and our target values, uh, as I said previously, what lies in between and what we really need to focus on is the, the way that we we'll map the predictors, the, the uh, external drivers, let's say, to, um, uh, to chlorophyll A. So within our work, we have been testing diverse techniques, but today's focus is going to be on random forests, which are actually um, uh, an aggregation, let's say, of individual uh, decision trees, simple decision trees that are trained on smaller resembled subsets of our whole data set, and uh, trees that are using subset few of the attributes of our predictors that we saw it before. Now, the good thing is that they are, can be what I refer to here as human readable. You can access its uh, tree of the decision of the of the forest and see how it produces its predictions. Another good thing is that it's not only fit for um, producing real values uh, to solve, let's say, regression problems, but it can be used for classification purposes. Now, uh, random forests have been uh, applied in many scientific domains uh, with uh, success. And we know beforehand that they can handle uh, noisy inputs satisfactorily. And this is something that we will certainly 
uh, phase, especially when it comes to forecasting. And their um, predictions are quite robust to this noise. So this is something that beforehand we knew that it could be helpful. So the only bad, let's say, um, feature is that they do not extrapolate. Um, they will never produce any value um, beyond those that they have been trained on. So there are uh, techniques that we have tested that can extrapolate with uh, with other issues, of course, that we have to face. But this is something that we should bear in mind. So today we are discussing about how random forests were le were trained, let's say, to map those hydrometeorological drivers to chlorophyll A values of um, lakes and reservoirs. So in our case, um, this uh, methodological, let's say, approach, this formulation of our models, we want to test its uh, um, validity, of course, but also its transferability to uh, more than one case. So we were lucky enough uh, to uh, have a, uh, an international, let's say, consortium that gave us access to um, three diverse uh, surface water bodies, uh, one in the United States, one in Italy, and one in Australia, um, all of which have different, let's say, needs in terms of modeling, but also different phenomena to be simulated. Uh, this is what I mean. So in all those uh, case studies that we uh, tested our approach, uh, we also had to, to focus on what we refer to as areas of interest. So this is uh, specific areas within the um, the water body within the uh, reservoir or the lake that have been indicated as important by an end user. So, for example, for uh, Mularzia Reservoir in Italy, this is the water abstraction area. Or for um, the case study in, uh, in the United States, this is Harsa Lake. Uh, this could be, the, again, a water abstraction area or um, the bathing waters. There's a central bay here that uh, is used for bathing. So we, are, we will be focusing on these specific areas of interest in each uh, and every uh, case study to test, as I said, not only its validity, but also uh, the potential, but also its uh, transferability. Another important uh, aspect to consider is the fact that uh, we, uh, from, from the early beginning, we wanted to opt out from being locked in um, in case-specific data sources. So on one hand, that's quite self-evident that by using satellite-derived data, we're not having these case-specific, uh, let's say, uh, problems. Uh, literally, we can work in most uh, of the uh, lakes and reservoirs of the world. Uh, so we had to consider similar um, global-scale uh, uh, data sources for our external drivers, for hydrology and meteorology. And, to this end, we um, turned into um, simulation, simulated data from uh, global scale models, either that comes from uh, reanalysis data of uh, numerical weather prediction models or hydrological models of, uh, that are continental or global scale. So in this way, it doesn't matter if we have a, a data for, um, let's say, inflows in, from the upstream, upstream catchments, we can have them we can have them from uh, from simulated global scale models. So uh, today we will follow one specific case to see uh, this testing of, um, of the relevance of multispectral data as we initially discussed. And this case will be uh, Mularzi Reservoir in, uh, in Italy. So um, as I, I mentioned, um, the main data sources for uh, our external forcings uh, for meteorology and hydrology are going to be uh, reanalysis uh, historical simulations uh, for the case of meteorology. This is going to be uh, the ERA-5 land data set with a, uh, a temporal coverage of uh, five years from 2015 to 2019. And the same applies for the hydrological component uh, in which we're going to be using time series, this specific uh, period uh, from uh, Europe's European hype um, model, which is a model uh, being uh, developed and uh, operated by one of our partners, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. Uh, 
uh, regarding the data sources for uh, chlorophyll A values, uh, we've said that we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be focusing on specific areas of interest. So what we did is to create a time series of this area uh, from Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 imagery uh, being processed by um, a sensory dependent physics-based approach, uh, approach developed by uh, another of our um, uh, prime water patterns, uh, that is EOMAT. Uh, one uh, important thing to notice is, however, that those uh, retrievals, chlorophyll A retrievals, have been previously validated by uh, Dr. Bersiani and others uh, in previous in previous work. So, uh, in terms of data, these are the main and only data sources that we are using. Now, Mulaje Reservoir uh, is actually a large and quite deep one. Um, is, uh, among other uses, uh, used for uh, potable water production. And what uh, seems to be observed from our data is that it experiences um, let's say late winter to early spring outbreaks of chlorophyll. So this is what we want to actually capture with our uh, data and try to, with our models, sorry, and try to understand why this happens and see if we can forecast it uh, accurately. Now, the uh, methodological, let's say, um, roadmap of this of this effort is can be described in these five steps uh, that I'm showing uh, in this slide. So the first two uh, refer to data pre-processing, uh, which in many cases is how we turn from gridded data, two-dimensional data, to uh, a simple time series, uh, and how we treat data gaps and typical, let's say, uh, pre-processing steps for every data-driven solution. Uh, the same applies for uh, the second step, which is the feature selection, uh, which eliminates those um, features, those variables that seem to be not that influential in our uh, modeling approach. So these are quite uh, common and often in similar uh, approaches, so I'm not going to be discussing today much of these two uh, steps. What I will be uh, showing in the following uh, presentation is steps three, four, and five. That means we will be seeing how uh, the model performs uh, when it is trained, how we can, how can we interpret it, and how can we understand and let's say take a look into its internals and understand how it it predicts, and finally uh, how it operates when it comes to forecasting, and uh, equally importantly, of course, um, uh, if, it's, if this uh, forecasting has an adding value, if it's uh, offering information that are relevant uh, or at least better than naive alternatives. So let's move to this, uh, to this um, three, let's say, uh, steps and see how we uh, perform for this specific case study. One important uh, aspect to, to consider is um, the fact that uh, this five-year-long period that we are trying to simulate results in roughly um, 163 uh, observations. In any case, this cannot be considered what you know, most of us think as um, big data problems. On the contrary, we have uh, quite a few uh, data uh, at hand. Um, naturally, this is uh, a result of many uh, obvious problems from cloudiness, uh, aerosol-related uh, problems, and all the um, anticipated uh, issues that can hamper the production of um, uh, chlorophyll A retrievals from satellites. One, uh, another aspect that uh, is related to our problem is not only that we have uh, sparse data, but uh, we have also non-uniformly sampled data, as I mentioned here. And th that means that uh, there may be periods of time when we have, uh, let's say, two observations in a week, and then we have uh, a gap of three weeks, and then again we have three observational data in one week, and so on. So we don't have a uniform, let's say, uh, sampling uh, throughout this five-year period that we try to simulate, which, again, uh, 
and we will see that uh, and we'll, we'll discuss it today is an issue uh, that may impede the production of credible models. So having few data at hand, this, uh, let's say, uh, drives us to um, work with different validation approaches. We adopted a five-fold cross-validation. So um, I think we, would, we should better look how we perform after training in these test sets that um, uh, are created through this cross-validation. So uh, in this graph on the right-hand side, you can see with the uh, green circles, uh, how the raw data, the chlorophyll A values uh, look like uh, from 2015 to 2019. And uh, with the orange uh, continuous line, you will see uh, our um, predictions, uh, our cross-validated predictions. So uh, I think it's quite evident that the temporal uh, variation uh, is well represented and the model overall produces reasonable errors. To have um, an inkling of the magnitude of errors, uh, in absolute um, terms, this, is, uh, this was uh, 3.9 micrograms per liter. And in relative terms, this translates into 35%, uh, uh, I think. So overall, I think we can say that uh, the model uh, performs satisfactorily, but uh, there are uh, cases in which it fails to uh, to predict accurately, and that cases uh, are those few data points uh, at which we have uh, higher chlorophyll A values, as you can see, um, in between 2018 and uh, 2019. Now, the fact is that, as I said before, um, we have really few uh, observations available during during these periods of chlorophyll A outbreaks. So our model, in order to be general enough, uh, treats those few data as noise. So it does not, let's say, try to capture them, uh, and thereby it tends to other predict them. But overall, I think uh, we have a, a credible representation of the uh, temporal variation of chlorophyll A in our, uh, in our case. So as I said, one um, main um, aspect of our work is to understand how it op this model operates. So for the case of random forests, and this is a model-specific approach, we tend to opt for um, this variable importance metrics by permutation. This is, uh, in very few words, uh, we randomly permute data across a predictor and we estimate the uh, increase in error uh, due to this permutation. So, in this graph, the larger, the, the wider the bar of this gray bar uh, is, the more influential the parameter. So even if in absolute terms, these values do not, cannot be interpreted very easily, in relative terms, they indicate that, for example, air temperature radiation uh, and air temperature seem to be the most influential parameters, and so does um, the total phosphorus loads. So we can get can get, let's say, an overall uh, assessment of predictor importance, but still we don't have uh, a clear understanding on how uh, air temperature or radiation may impact uh, chlorophyll A predictions. This can be performed initially um, with uh, some model agnostic visualization tools. Model agnostic means that we uh, can use them uh, with uh, whichever uh, data-driven model we want. So either that's partial dependence plots or the individual conditional expectation plots. In general, they, these approaches try to visualize the average, let's say, relationships between predictors and their responses. So for example, on the top uh, right side, um, we can see on the vertical axis chlorophyll A values and on the two horizontal axes, the normalized are temperature and total radiation. So uh, from this type of visualization, uh, we can get, for example, that uh, this orange to yellow high chlorophyll A values correspond to rather uh, moderate air temperature and uh, low total radiation. And this is in line with what we previously said, that 
uh, we are experiencing and we are observing in, in our case. And that is the um, outbreaks of algae production during um, this um, mostly late, um, late winter and early spring at periods, of course, that we have uh, moderated temperature and uh, lowered radiation values. And the same can be, can be performed, of course, for all other parameters. For example, considering total phosphorus loads, we can see that um, the higher uh, loads, uh, the higher the chlorophyll A values that we will eventually uh, predict. So this is one way to understand uh, the impact of uh, external drivers to predictions. So the last approach that we followed is what is typically considered as a uh, local explanation. In other words, through these simply explanations, what we get um, is um, the relative contribution, let's say, of its feature to the deviation of the prediction from the average. For example, uh, if we take a look on the top right uh, graph, we can see that our prediction is uh, way below, let's say, average. I can remember, for example, um, when I created this plot, that this corresponds to uh, August uh, 2018, I think. So we predict 3.6 micrograms per liter, and the reason is, as you can see, that total radiation and air temperature are not favoring uh, chlorophyll A prediction. The same can be performed to every single prediction that we have. Either this is uh, successful or it's uh, a failure. For example, we can have um, an understanding of why we failed to predict uh, a, specific, a specific value by just seeing what contributes to this, to this failure. So this local explanation is also uh, a useful tool, was also, also a useful uh, tool that we had in order to interpret uh, specific um, um, behaviors of, of our model. And uh, overall, it corroborated the previous findings that mostly air temperature and moderate values of, of air temperature and total radiation uh, seem to influence uh, uh, chlorophyll A production in our, uh, in our case. So um, overall, uh, and based on our experience with other methods, um, there are, uh, I, I can say, let's say that um, there is uh, an opportunity to um, gain some insight in the model internals. This is not always, always the case. Uh, there are examples, for uh, let's say, that we tested algorithms that um, this uh, response surface that we uh, saw before that could explain the model were completely uh, rugged. Uh, you, you could see, for example, um, high values being situated uh, in the vicinity of low values, and th they tend to give you this, you know, um, complicated uh, input-output relationship that cannot be easily communicated. And of course, and not uh, translated into what we already understand as relevant mechanisms for a phenom plankton uh, um, dynamics. So, since we've seen this first component of interpretability, uh, the second vital question that we asked even from the beginning is how do we perform if we take those models that we see that they have their strengths and weaknesses and we push them in uh, forecasting? Uh, so why, how did we uh, actually evaluate it? Um, by performing what uh, is usually called as a reforecast experiment. So what we did actually is we uh, gathered expired forecasts of hydrology and meteorology and we rerun, re-simulated uh, this historical period by using those forecasts, those expired forecasts, instead of uh, the values that we have trained the models. So in this case, uh, we are, uh, let's say, going as close as we can to real uh, conditions. Uh, and we can understand the impact uh, of introducing forecasting uncertainty in our models. So um, I, I think we should go to see how this illustrates um, uh, in our, through this uh, case study. 
So again, uh, we can see with the green dots, the um, EO derived data. And again, the uh, orange uh, continuous line is what we also seen before as our historical, let's say, simulation. Now, the, the blue line that will follow is the day ahead forecast of this specific period. So as you can see, um, the majority, let's say, the variation, the variability uh, of the uh, of chlorophyll A, uh, of chlorophyll A in, in Mularjea in our case study was largely captured, but still we have introduced uh, specific biases uh, in uh, actually in these warmer periods uh, in time. So this blue line indicates again uh, this deviation from our historical uh, simulation. So this is actually uh, a clear indication that uh, before pushing your model into a uh, real-time conditions and forecasting, you really need to address the issue of uh, biases that are introduced by the, um, uh, by the uh, forecasted uh, input. So by simple, by let's say adopting one simple approach that we did, and that is a, a quantile mapping approach, uh, uniformly applied to all uh, variables, this is what we get, and this is this yellow line that you will see right now in the graph. As you can see, we moved away from the blue and we uh, progressed towards the, the orange one. That means that we have successfully reduced the impact of the biases of forecast and we have get closer to uh, our best case uh, predictions, which is this, uh, this orange line that we have been seeing so far. So, Again, I think uh, this. I need to mention that there is much more further, uh, much more research needed on, in terms of bias adjustments. But in any case, I think this is a clear indication that we can progress um, towards uh, better forecasts. But again, um, forecasts. Uh, we said better forecasts, but we really need to evaluate what is what do we mean by better, which is the adding value of our forecast. So what we do is typically um, a benchmarking exercise with a naive alternative. And this naive alternative is actually the um, sticking to the last known observation. This means that uh, this naive in this naive alternative, uh, the day ahead or the five days ahead or the 10 days ahead values of chlorophyll is going to be the same as the one that we currently know. So in other terms, what we really want in this um, in this testing, in this evaluation, in this, in this benchmarking exercise, is to beat this naive alternative. In other terms, uh, and when we compare the errors, this um, uh, ratio of errors, we really need our forecasts for all lead times to be below uh, the value of one. So in our case. Uh, for the Mularja case study, this was uh, this was true. Uh, you can see that we were better than the naive alternative for up to 10 days ahead, but still, uh, mostly due to uh, meteorological uncertainty, the adding value decreases, even not that sizable, but it's still, we can say that our skill deteriorate over uh, lead times. So um, this was the case for... Um, Mularjea, but also we uh, looked into other case studies with diverse, as I said, needs. So I tried to um, consolidate a few lessons learned from all the case studies. And um, I think that, uh, to be fair, it's not always you know, about pointing out great results, but also introducing potential problems. So uh, one of those I think we have already addressed, and that is data gaps. Um, data scarcity, let's say. Uh, I think that based on this uh, overall uh, uh, seven areas of interest, those that had data points fewer than 140 seem to be introducing the largest simulation errors. So data gaps is an issue here to be considered. And again, uh, and this is something that I also briefly uh, discussed previously, the fact that those data may have few extreme values 
may also be a, an issue to consider. For example, this case on the top right, uh, which is from the United States, the case study in the United States, as you can see, uh, the vast majority of data falls around 20 micrograms per liter. And this is what in the, uh, eventually the model tries to simulate. But the problem is that we really need to predict those extreme values, these 80 micrograms per liter data point that we can see here. So can we do that? Is there a cure for this type of problems? So we um, looked into several possible solutions. I will very quickly try to uh, give an inkling of, uh, of its, uh, let's say, proposed solution. Uh, one of which is, of course, change, changing the um, way that we fine tune our models. So in a way, we want to, um, to favor uh, fitting uh, these few but high uh, extreme values rather than, you know, uh, staying around the mean uh, response uh, of this uh, time series signal. And this was not always, um, let's say, uh, a good choice to do. Uh, we didn't see huge uh, impact in, our, in the way that we train our models. There are also other algorithms that can treat this type of imbalanced and scarce data, but um, at least to the extent of our knowledge, we did not, you know, um, had some uh, um, uh, very positive uh, outputs. On the contrary, what seems to be um, a good option, at least for the case that I'm um, showing right now, is uh, reverting to other data sources. And I'm still referring to multispectral data. For example, in this uh, in this case study, we had the opportunity to work with uh, Sentinel-3 data, which resulted actually in a five-fold uh, increase in available data points. So we exploit the higher temporal resolution and this gives us the opportunity to capture these um, uh, peak values better and create more credible models. So reverting to other um, data points is, um, uh, to other data sources, I'm sorry, is a potential uh, solution. And lastly, um, another effort that we have been uh, uh, performing so far is changing the way we uh, understand and we provide predictions. So instead of giving simple, um, let's say, uh, real values of uh, the day ahead or five days ahead uh, chlorophyll A uh, values, we change the predictions into categorical ones. So we just predict and forecast um, the possibility of being below or above specific uh, user-defined uh, thresholds. And through this way, through these categorical predictions, we managed to become, let's say, uh, more uh, credible in terms of our uh, predictive abilities. The question, however, remains, is this um, enough uh, in terms of decision making uh, or not? And this is a question that we are trying to um, to set forth to, to our um, uh, end users in the project. And we're trying to understand right now, actually. So, uh, I think I should be start. I should start wrapping up. There are also other applications important uh, within this um, data-oriented, let's say, a universe of, uh, of modeling. I will not discuss them today, uh, and I think I should wrap up and uh, jump into the concluding uh, remarks. So, the first, I think, um, take-home message is that. Multispectral data seem to be a valuable source of observations that can lead us to the development of credible and transparent data-driven models. Uh, in, from our experience in these specific cases, uh, and even, as I say, no algorithm should be expected to be as you know, the best performing solution, I think random forests seem to be uh, um, a good starting point for providing accurate and uh, transparent uh, models. But as I point out, um, I think we're, we have just started uh, scratching the surface. I think data-driven uh, modeling is not the cure for all modeling diseases. We've seen that there are uh, cases that they are not fit for purpose. And in those cases, um, we really need to in investigate a little bit more how we can uh, deal with those problems either by fusing diverse data sources and complementary data sources or by um, uh, 
sifting the way we uh, perceive uh, our uh, prediction. So um, all those uh, graphs and discussion that we have done so far uh, are all available in Prime Waters Virtual Lab. This was these actually were parts of two experiments that we have uh, undertaken. There are many more to uh, to investigate. Uh, and what you will actually be able to access through our virtual lab is not only a comprehensive, let's say, description of its methodological component, but also input and output data, all those data that I have been showing, and the scripts and code that have produced them. So um, in terms of the modeling components, uh, all of these are going to be fully available and open, uh, openly available from December uh, 2022. So in one month from now, all input and output data and of course scripts and codes and everything are going to be readily available for reproducing, testing, and opening up this uh, huge discussion on the utility of data, of, of satellite data in uh, water quality modeling. And by that, I would like to thank you very much for being, again, for being given the uh, opportunity to um, put forth this uh, topic and part of the work that has been performed uh, within uh, Prime Water. Thank you again. Great, great job. Thank you very much, um, uh, Kyriakos. I'm going to use my reaction button and put up some um, clapping emoji. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, if anybody had any questions um, to go ahead and, uh, and unmute. You don't need to raise your hand. Uh, just go ahead and ask uh, Kyriakos your question directly. Um, while people are trying to find that unmute button, I did want to ask you one um, logistical uh, question, um, Kyriakos. Are you able to um, estimate if there would be an upward limit on the number of sources of data that you could fuse together? I know that you had uh, mentioned um, Sentinel two and three, but there's a number of multispectral um, opportunity missions coming on. And I wondered if there was, if you could speculate as to the number that might make it un, un, an unwieldy forecast. Well, uh, to be honest, you know, um, <laughs> they, the idea is that the more the better, but um, the thing is that, um, and this is a discussion that we are trying to open within Prime Water community, um that uh, we really need to uh, find uh, uh, a, a, a good way to fuel, to fuse and to blend these diff, uh, let's say um, diverse uh, data sources because we very often come to what is uh, co a common issue and that is data conflicts. So we really um, try to solve that by, um, introducing um, specific weights to its um, data source based on its related uncertainties. So in principle, as I said, um, the more the better, but again, uh, this is not uh, problem free. I believe that uh, this will open up a discussion on how you can more um, uh, efficiently blend diverse data sources to solve uh, major issues as, for example, uh, as I said, uh, the, the development of uh, credible uh, and accountable models. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, um, Kyriakos, you mentioned that um, the data that you used would be available on the virtual lab um, in a, in about a, a month and a half or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, just wanted to point out to everybody, I, I already posted the link in the, in the chat um, to where today's recording will be posted a little bit later. Also on the website, we do have the link to the virtual lab um, as well as the one that you provided um, in your um, last slide, or your, your next to last slide. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that the, just 
just to give a little commercial for the virtual lab, uh, I think it's quite quite a useful tool, um, especially to fill the gap sort of in in a, between a training course and um, skill building on your own. It's useful to have those uh, opportunities where you provide the data set, you walk them through the, uh, you provide all the inputs and show what the output should look like, and then somebody can um, uh, do it on their own and see if they test whether or not they got the same um, results and maybe um, find out what they uh, what, what they did wrong <clears throat> um, if they didn't get the same results uh, to, to build a skill. So I think it's quite valuable. Uh, any other questions um, for Kiriakos, um, either on Prime Water, uh, his talk today, or the virtual lab? Great. Well, is it's definitely exciting work, and I'm really hoping that uh, the forecasting that you talked about today will be um, picked up and sustained um, at the at the end of the Prime Water project. Um, for for certain, it will provide at least a, at least a pathway to better informing um, users. I think, in my opinion. So thanks again, uh, Kiriakos, for your excellent presentation today. We were delighted to um, to co-host um, along with Prime Water. Um, we'll let you know that the next webinar um, is um, in just a few short days, November 2nd. Um, we um, normally try to keep them a little bit further apart, but um, we've had to make some adjustments for schedules. So they, these two are coming uh, close together. Um, it's actually at 1 p.m. UTC on November 2nd. It will be presented by Stefan Simis from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and he is going to recap the um, Monocle project, which is a, a longstanding Horizon 2020 uh, project. So we hope that you all come back and join us for that. Um, and if uh, you want to um, check out some other future um, webinars, we do have those also posted on our website as well. Um, also wanted to mention uh, that we have a newly formed um, Early Career Society uh, within GeoAquaWatch. We are also doing that um, in conjunction with Prime Waters. Um, oh, I forget the name of their, uh, but but they they have an equivalent early. Uh, I think it's Early Professionals. Um, uh, Early, early professionals group um, within Prime Water. Uh, and we, we just launched that. Um, and uh, there will be uh, a group, a forum available on our website as well. So if you know anyone who self-identifies as an early career professional um, in water quality, we hope that you will um, point them to those resources. So we are uh, definitely looking forward to at least one webinar coming up um, to promote that uh, as well. So thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks again to our speaker, Kiriakos Kandras. Oh, thank, um, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Bye.